G'day, Steve Starlo Starling here. Welcome to my Cutting Edge Fishing Wisdom podcast and part one of this series, Soft Plastics 101. Recently, while I was being interviewed for a popular podcast, I was asked to list the most significant advances in recreational fishing that I'd witnessed during my lifetime on the water. Obvious candidates include graphite rods, braided gel spun polyethylene lines, bow mounted electric motors, and the mind boggling leaps that have been made in marine electronics such as depth sounders and GPS plotters across the five decades that I've been fishing. But I also threw in what I like to call the soft plastic revolution, a phenomenon that I've not only observed with great interest, but also been actively involved in. Truth is, soft lures of one sort or another were around well before I was born. A few years back, while I was researching a book on this subject, I did some serious digging into the history of commercially made soft plastic lures. It's a fascinating rabbit hole to dive down. I won't go into detail here, but suffice to say that there appear to have been two roughly parallel evolutionary pathways in the Midwest of the United States during the late 1940s and early 50s. One driven by Nick and Cosma Cream of Ohio, and the other by father and son team Bill and Vern Norman from Indiana. There are also some rather interesting intersections and overlaps between these two separate family sagas. As I said, it's a fascinating story, and if you're keen to pursue it further, a simple Google search makes a pretty good starting point. Of course, it's highly likely that other innovative anglers were already making their own soft lures well before the creams launched their rubber worms onto the US market. Even here in Australia, there are vague tales of frog shapes cut from inner tubes and the like being fitted with hooks and used to tempt barramundi and other fish as far back as World War II and perhaps even earlier. These historical footnotes aside, the first that most Aussie anglers really knew of true soft plastic lures, as opposed to soft-bodied plugs like the French-made Rublex floppy, came with the arrival on our shores of the earliest Mr. Twisters and Blue Fox Vibratales. This happened around the beginning of the 1970s. These innovative offerings caused quite a stir in the embryonic sport fishing scene that was already sweeping our nation, driven to a large degree by Ron Calcutt's trend-setting Australian Angler magazine. By the time I went to work for Calcutt at the start of the 1980s, soft plastics had gained a significant toehold here and it even featured on the cover of Ron's influential publication, which had by now changed its name to Fishing World. Softies have become especially popular among switched-on anglers targeting Flathead down south, where the Mr. Twister single and double-tail grubs had become become favourite choices, as well as Barra up north, where the fish-shaped vibratail was more of a hit. This era, from the very end of the 1960s through to the early 80s, is what I refer to as the first wave of the soft plastic revolution in Australia. Interestingly, the widespread use of soft plastics didn't really extend far beyond Flathead and Barra during that first wave, despite the fact that many other species were hooked on these lures as incidental or accidental catches. It wasn't until the early 1990s that a more diverse second wave of interest began to develop around soft plastics, driven in large part by the writings of adventurous travelling anglers, especially those doing extended road trips across the north of the country. Their breakthrough discovery finally began to open the eyes of other fishers to the almost endless opportunities presented by these lures. Now the only real stumbling blocks were limited availability, excessive cost, especially for a lure that could be destroyed by a single tail or a leather jacket bite, and the fact that almost all of the plastic tails, jig heads and other paraphernalia then available when you could find them were hand-me-downs and cast-offs from the American bass fishing market. Some of these suited our needs, and lots didn't. Finding the right one was something of a lucky dip. It was around the turn of the new millennium when my good mate and fellow fishing communicator Kay Bushy Bush and myself began to get super excited about the potential for soft plastics to completely revolutionise the styles of fishing we loved best, especially finessing brim on lures, which was something that had lit a fire under us and a lot of other anglers at the time, and even spawned a new tournament circuit. We began scouring mail order catalogues and obscure local tackle inventories for smaller, more 
more subtle plastics that we could press into this roll, and we were beginning to kick some serious goals as a result. By a stroke of serendipitous good fortune, Bushy and I were both on the Shimano Pro Anglers team at the time, and already doing a fair amount of product testing, promotional work, and tackle development for that company. One memorable day, our friend and Shimano Australia's then boss, the late, great John Dunphy, came to us with an intriguing prospect. How did we feel about the idea of designing a range of soft plastic lures and hardware specifically for the Australian market? (laughs) Naturally enough, we all but fell over ourselves in taking Dunph up on his offer. I suspect that even if we'd had an inkling ahead of time about just how much work would be involved or how long it'd take to get it done properly, we'd still still have knocked Dunf down in our rush to sign up. It was simply too good an opportunity to miss. The rest, as they say, is history. The initial production run of three squidgy designs, the Wriggler, Fish and Shad, in half a dozen sizes and colours, finally hit the market in about 2002. We already knew how well they worked. We'd spent hundreds of hours field testing and refining them. But we also understood that simply having the right products was only part of the story. What was also required was a multi-pronged education program designed to teach Aussie anglers how best to use these deadly lures. Through magazine articles, books, TV segments, how-to videos and a rolling series of squidgy nights live stage presentations that saw us travel the length and breadth of the nation several times over, we literally took the squidgy phenomenon on the road and helped to forever change the way that so many Australians fished. I still feel immensely proud of what we achieved through those very busy years. Sure, there was a strong commercial imperative to it all. Shimano sold a lot of squidgies, and through the modest royalties we received as payment for our ongoing services, Bushy and I found ourselves with reasonably steady incomes for the first time in our long careers as freelance writers and presenters. They were golden days, but above all, they were incredibly rewarding times, especially Especially in terms of the broad smiles we saw etched on the dials of successful anglers once they'd cracked the pattern and learned how to use these newfangled lures. Revisiting regions we'd gone into just a year or two earlier to spread the word among sometimes cynical and conservative fishers only to be mobbed on our return by enthusiastic converts all wanting to show us photos of the amazing fish they'd caught. (laughs) That was such a blast. Naturally, we only had the running to ourselves for a handful of years, and other local tackle companies soon saw the writing on the wall and got on board. Today, there are scores of excellent brands and styles of soft plastics available on the market, many now designed with considerable local input to better suit Australian species and conditions. But Bushy and I feel quietly justified in claiming that we were there at the very start of this momentous third wave, and that we helped to finally bring the soft plastics phenomenon to the masses and to the mainstream by sharing what we discovered on our own personal journeys. It's not a bad legacy to leave for future generations of fellow fishers. Soft plastics work. In fact, I would argue that as a class of artificial baits or lures, they are far and away the most effective fish-catching tools ever conceived by the minds of inventive men and women. There are plastics available today that will catch everything from the tiniest trout finning in a trickling mountain brook to barrel-sized tuna riding ocean currents far beyond the edge of the continental shelf. There are plastics that can be bounced on the seabed at extreme depths beyond the reach of sunlight and others capable of wriggling their way seductively through the exposed upper branches of a shallow snag or over the rails of an oyster rack in a tannin-strained estuary backwater. These remarkable lures appeal not only to every predatory fish species you could possibly think of in both fresh and salt water, but also to many omnivores and even delicate small mouth vegetarians not normally considered as legitimate lure fishing targets. Soft plastics simply work. The reasons good soft plastics are so incredibly effective at fooling fish are both blindingly apparent and also a little less obvious. Sure, they can be made to look and swim like living critters, but they also feel like the real thing when a fish chews or crunches on them. In fact, they can even be made to smell and taste real. Combine all those attributes and you come up with an extremely convincing lie to tell to a gullible fish. A lie so believable that these cunning lures often get eaten when they're simply sinking through the water or lying motionless on the bottom. There aren't too many hard-bodied lures you can make that claim about. 
For all these reasons, soft plastics are and will remain an important string in the bow of almost every serious lure fisher. But as effective as they are, you still need to get a few absolute basics right when selecting, rigging and presenting soft plastics. Lots of anglers still seem to be deeply challenged when it comes to actually selecting that first soft plastic to try at a new location or even to kick off a new day's fishing at a well-known spot. Over the course of a year, I get to talk to a lot of soft plastic fishers from around the country. Some I meet at seminars and shows. Others I chat with via the various pages on Facebook that I run or help to administer, especially the Starlow's Fishertopia and squidgy soft plastics pages, as well as through my blogs or via feedback about YouTube videos on my Starlo Gets Real channel. Others send me letters or emails through the various publications that I write for. However, no matter what the source of the inquiry, one question or variations of it tends to dominate the calls for advice that I receive. Typically, that query begins with the words, what's the best soft plastic for blank. (laughs) The rest of that sentence almost always contains a species of fish and a precise location. What's the best soft plastic to use for brim in Sydney Harbour? What's the best soft plastic for trout in Lake Eildon? What's the best soft plastic for flathead on the Gold Coast? What's the best soft plastic for snapper off Perth? Barramundi in the Top Ends Daily River? And so on it goes. I can't help but smile at these well-meaning questions. Anglers clearly have their favourite fishing spots and they seem to expect that the fish they chase in these beloved haunts will behave differently to those living further down the road, around the bend or across the border. Generally speaking, this is not the case. I've caught redfin perch in the New England rivers of North northwestern New South Wales, and also in the very old England rivers around the historical university city of Cambridge in Great Britain, where they're simply known as perch. Rather unsurprisingly, these fish looked exactly the same, behaved in a very similar manner, and happily ate identical lures in both locations, literally a world apart. So rather than asking me or someone else to nominate the best softie for catching trout in Tasmania's Arthur's Lake, an angler would be far better off seeking advice and opinions regarding the optimum approaches for targeting brown trout in relatively shallow, fertile lakes with fairly clear water and lots of healthy weed beds. That way, the answer they received would be applicable across a whole range of waterways featuring similar target species and conditions. The message I'm trying to get across to you as I explore the process of picking plastics is a pretty simple one. Fish are fish, and a particular species will behave in a very similar way when presented with a particular habitat type, season, degree of water clarity, and set of food sources, regardless of its precise geographic location. This is a great thing to know, because it means that once we sort out some of the effective guidelines for one place and time, we can apply them in the future, whenever we encounter similar conditions, even if we're a long, long way from home. That's a useful lesson to learn. It still surprises me how daunted some anglers are by the thought of making that initial choice, tying on that first lure and actually beginning to fish. It seems that the entire process genuinely freaks out some people. They open their tackle boxes at the water's edge, scan its content with confused, worried expressions, sit in a silent agony of tangled indecision for several minutes, then turn desperately to look for someone to direct their burning question to. What should I use? (laughs) If you truly have absolutely no idea where to start, then take the plunge and make a guess. Tie something on. Give it a swim and see if the fish show any interest at all in it. If they don't, change your lure and try again. In truth, your approach really needs to be quite that random and experimental. You should at least have an idea of what lives in the waterway and what some of the most important food sources are likely to be. This basic knowledge is a big help in fine-tuning your initial selection. If it's a piece of water renowned for producing yellowtail kingfish or bluefin tuna, it doesn't make a lot of sense to kick off with a 5 centimetre worm or grub imitation. Conversely, if it's a gin-clear mountain stream with a good population of aquatic insect nymphs, it'll most likely be counterproductive to tie on a 15 or 20 centimetre fish-shaped plastic swim bait. (laughs) Engage your basic common sense and begin by pruning down at least the size selection process. If you're chasing big fish that you suspect are eating big things, then choose a biggish lure. If you're after smaller fish that you think are eating tiny food, pick a little lure. It's not rocket science. 
While you're at it, at least have a think about roughly matching the shape, colour and swimming action of those likely food items. Fly fishers call this thought process matching the hatch, and it's one of the most important steps in successful lure selection. However, be willing to accept that you might be wrong in your initial selection. It happens. Just occasionally those big kingies or tuna might actually be dining on tiny bait fish half the size of your little finger. Or the larger trout in that high country waterway may actually be eating their smaller cousins. That's okay. You'll find this out when they ignore your first choice. What I'm trying to tell you is that nothing and no one can give you better feedback on your lure choices than the fish themselves. Let them tell you what they want. And when they do, make sure you're listening. The next most important question I field after the perennial what's the best lure for is what's the best colour for blank. (laughs) In my opinion, far too many anglers expend far too much time and energy agonising over the lure colour issue. Yeah, sometimes it's important. Occasionally, it's absolutely critical. But I'll let you in on a little secret. Most of the time, the actual colour of your lure is far, far less important than its size, action and running depth. And that's exactly where I usually rate colour in the lure selection process, behind size, action and running depth. Yet I'm so rarely asked, what's the best depth to target this fish at? Or what sort of speed and lure action do they like? Instead, most anglers seem to believe that if they're told the magic colour to use, success will be instantly theirs. If only fishing was so simple. Once again, matching the hatch is a very good place to start. If the mud eyes or dragonfly nymphs crawling up your wader legs in a trout lake are all light brown, then try using a light brown lure. If the most common smaller fish, and therefore the most likely food source in a brim estuary, have green backs and silvery bellies, try a greenish lure with a pale belly. Remember what I said before about rocket science? If no obvious food sources are present and you're not sure what the fish are actually eating, look at the water itself. Is it clear or dirty? And if it's somewhere in between those extremes, is it green-tinged, brownish or tannin-stained like a cup of tea? Whatever it is, the little critters living in it are likely to be wearing a roughly similar hue. So if it's greenish, go for a green lure. If it's tea-like, choose a red or brown plastic. Again, this is just a starting point. The tick of approval or otherwise will come from the true experts on this issue, the fish themselves. In other words, if your first choice draws a blank, try something else. As a final word on colour selection, there's a rule of thumb I've used for many years that usually stands me in pretty good stead. It goes something like this. If the water is gin clear, start with very subdued, natural and even semi-transparent tones. If it's a bit dirtier, choose something a bit brighter. If it's very discoloured, go for vivid fluorescent tones. If it's absolutely filthy, Try solid black or purple or revert to smelly old bait or go home. (laughs) Finally, if your mate's catching fish and you're not, then use exactly what he or she is using. I used the expression, it's not rocket science earlier, but in closing, I've got a little admission to make. Consistently successful lure selection can be both a lot simpler and also a lot more complex than rocket science. Let's face it, a rocket's just a tube full of propellant fuel, ideally with some stabilising fins near the tail end. If you point it heavenward and ignite the fuel, it should fly. So maybe rocket science isn't really so complicated after all. On the other hand, fish can be incredibly fickle critters. Their moods, for want of a better and less anthropomorphic term, constantly change, as does their behaviour and their choice of food. Sometimes they simply stop feeding altogether for lengthy periods, perhaps a lot of the time in fact. When they do, the smartest lure choices in the world may still leave you with a limp line and a straight rod. After all, if we were always successful, this wonderful game of ours would be called catching, not fishing, and I'd wager that we'd soon grow bored with it. So don't be afraid of the lure selection process. Take the bull by the horns or the rocket by the fins and have a go. Start by narrowing the parameters of size, depth, action and colour in that order and making some educated guesses. Then test your hypotheses. Sometimes you'll find the right answer, sometimes you won't, and sometimes... (laughs) There is no right answer. That's fishing. One extremely vital area I haven't yet touched on in the first instalment of this two-part feature is the jigs, 
hooks, weights and other presentation vehicles needed to effectively rig soft plastics, get them into the water, make them swim as they should and, hopefully, allow you to connect with a few fish. I can't stress just how important this subject is and how much it was deficiencies in this area that conspired to hold back those first two waves of the Australian soft plastic revolution I talked about in the 1970s and the 1990s. During those decades, it was, in my opinion, the lack of choice, nuance and finesse in these presentation vehicles that prevented the soft plastic phenomenon from really taking off here. When Bushy and I first started playing around with the few smaller, more subtle and sophisticated finesse plastics that we were able to get our hands on around the turn of the millennium, we were constantly frustrated by the lack of suitable presentation vehicles for actually fishing with them. Ultimately, we overcame this serious deficiency by making our own, painstakingly bending and reshaping hooks and crimping split shot to their shanks in order to craft our own customised finesse jig heads. We learnt a great deal in the process and we were later able to apply that via the Squidgies brand. In the next instalment of this feature, I'll look at this critical area of jig heads, hooks, weights and other presentation vehicles in great depth, pardon the pun, as well as how to rig soft plastics for optimum results. Make sure you check it out. Meanwhile, happy soft plastic fishing and this is Starlo wishing you tight lines. If you enjoyed this episode and learnt something from it, I really hope you'll listen to future instalments and perhaps even check out all the videos on my Starlo Gets Real channel on YouTube. You can also help me generate new content by buying me a coffee or shouting me a beer. Just go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash Starlo. Thanks, and I hope to catch you soon. (laughs) 